Okay, today we're going to talk about the disappearance of Josie Offit. Now, this happened in July of 2007 from Sykesville, Pennsylvania. Now I'm familiar with this case just because it's happened uh, close to me, kind of been grouped in with uh, one of the cool cases that I solved uh, in the beginning of my career because it's from the same area. You have to forgive my voice today. I've been feeling a little bit under the weather the last couple of days, but as always, I will persevere. So don't worry about me. Just deal with my stuffiness today. And I wanted to get this out. I didn't want to wait because sometimes what happens is when I do this research and I get all this, you know, information, I'm writing it down. I'm running theories through my head. Uh, and trying to deduce what it could be, what it can be, what it shouldn't be, what it is. And then if I don't get it on tape right away, on tape, I'm talking like I'm from 1950. If I don't record it and get my thoughts down, I lose it. I don't lose it completely, but little details will, I'll forget. So I just wanted to get it going on this and uh, get it on. So, Joey Offit, she disappears in July. Now, why I just say July and not give a specific date is because there really is no specific date. Uh, and we'll get into why. And that's much like my first cold case, Don Miller, where we just had the last week of October of 1992. And I think I narrowed that down to October 24th during my investigation, but... That's all we knew. So in this case, it's July 2007, Sykesville, Pennsylvania. What happens is on July 3rd, she gets into an argument with her boyfriend. They do not live together. He lives in Clearfield, which is about 30 minutes from Sykesville. Uh, I've had a hunting camp in Clearfield which is in my family for 50 years, so I'm very familiar with that area as well. They argue about their newest child that they brought into the world. It's a six-week year, week year old, six-week year old. Well, it just sounds weird when it's not year. Six weeks old. That sounds better six week six week old infant <laughs> uh, that they have together they're not married Joey has two other kids so she has three total uh, a week previous to the maybe not a week month or so previous to this couple weeks previous to this she had visited her family in West Virginia and her one a child has stayed there with her now the reasoning for this is because she feels that she is overwhelmed with these three kids now with the newborn as well that's very important here okay and it's not unique it happens to a lot of women now I don't know if she is suffering from postpartum depression or or she just needs a break We'll get into her victimology after I go through this brief timeline. And we're going to go back over this timeline in more detail because it's very important here. But she has a fight with her boyfriend on July 3rd about the bathing habits of the six-week-old. He leaves. He goes home. Essentially, I put this in quotes, she is never seen again. However, I believe on July 5th, there is a sighting of her by a neighbor who says she was pushing a stroller. 
Now I'm going to leave it at that because I, I don't know if that's a credible sighting or not. And let's no contact, no contact, all the way down to July 12th. Remember, this all started happening on July 3rd. On July 12th, there's a house fire. Her house is on fire and it's deemed to be arson. There's a gas can found inside the home. A few days later, I believe on the 17th, her vehicle was found about an hour away in State College, Pennsylvania, which I'm very familiar with. And where it is found gives some possibilities and probabilities that need to be addressed. So, that's the timeline. I just gave a basis of it. I'm going to get into more detail about it. Today I'm drinking Propel because it was feel like a Propel day, not natural water. Anyway, I digress. Let's get into the most important part I feel of this case. What is that? That's right, a couple of you answered correctly. It's going to be victimology here. Now, I am not going to be able to tell you what happened here. I'll be upfront about that and you know and always remember it's not what you know it's what you can prove yet I think when we look at this case we can rule out certain aspects and sometimes when it comes to cold cases that's the most important thing is to rule certain things out because what are you doing when you do that you're deducing so if we're able to do that and be able to focus on one or two avenues and not worry about that other noise because we deduced it. Then I think you have a better probability of solving a case. So with that being said, let's get into victimology. Josie Offit was 33 years old. Again, she just had a newborn baby. And from what I understand, she had two kids to a guy named Alex. Now, I'm not sure about the third child the very I think it would be the first child uh, I'm not sure about the father I've never heard anything about the father of that and that would certainly be somebody I want to look into and I'm sure the police did that but I just didn't research it you know I didn't see anything in regards to that uh, connection as in any investigation you know it's important obviously to focus in for the first you know, I'd say 24 to 48 hours previous to the incident and find out what's going on. So when we do this, Alex is in the picture. Alex being the father of the newborn and one of the other children. But it's also very important to look at Joey. And through victimology, through from what I see, there's some things there, but I, I want more. I need to know more. You need to know what somebody's doing in a given circumstance. Uh, for instance, if she is pushing a baby stroller and somebody runs up to attack her, is she going to yell? Is she going to fight or flight? Is she what what you know? Those scenarios is what you want to know. Now, that doesn't that's not foolproof. Okay. Somebody, uh, you know, let's say I was attacked on the street and my, they go and interview my dad and my dad says, well, you know, maybe he would comply in order to, you know, make sure that nothing happens to him so he could see his, his daughter. And then they go and talk to my brother and my brother's like, oh, he beat the piss out of him. He wouldn't care if they had a gun, a knife, a machete, machine gun he would take his chance so you see how there would be two contradicting ideologies there you don't know but you want to know that as an investigator just because you then you can factor in both so in this case with Joey this is what her family says 
And I didn't see anything about her friends, past associates. Those are the people that you want to talk to. Yes, you want to talk to the family, okay? But they're going to give you one side of the story that they see, okay? Again, you go back and you talk to my parents. They're going to give you one side. They don't know the other side, okay? Um, they'll tell you, yeah, in high school, okay, yeah. He went to school. He was very kind, courteous, um, you know, showed up. You talk to my friends in high school, they'll say, oh, you know, he was a badass. He you know, got suspended for fighting all the time. He didn't do his work. He was always running around. He was drinking. See? I want to talk to teachers, friends, co-workers, neighbors. That is where you're going to get the meat of the victimology. Not from the parents. But in this instance, all I have is parents and friends. Or not friends, family members. And it shows her as being trusting, naive. She had a speech impediment, which again reminds me of Don Miller, my first case, because she had it too. She had de developmental disabilities. And one of the key things is she shut down after arguments. All that is good information. It's information you have to know, right? Yet, I, I need to know more. Was she promiscuous? What was her rage when she fought? Did she just shut down or did she attack? How was she in relationships? How was she when she got confronted authorities did she have a problem with authority figures those are questions I need answers to before I can make a good assessment I just don't have enough here but going on what I've researched I see that you know the the problem is a couple years maybe a year previous to this through a counseling session, and again, I want to know why she's going to counseling. She was diagnosed of having a mentality of a 14-year-old. Now, how these psychologists and psychiatrists come up with that number, I don't know. But I know if my 14-year-old self is thinking certain ways, it's definitely different than my 33-year-old self, right? So that is important to know. Now, along with victimology, having to know that, a neighborhood canvas, and I know, there's very little things that I would say that I know for sure, but I've worked with Pennsylvania State Police a long time, 15 years. You know, their troopers were my partners on narcotics investigations on cold cases so I've worked with them and I know that they did a neighborhood canvas I would be shocked if they didn't and that's very important because you need to know what was unusual happening in that neighborhood if you can look at the map you see that this is not a rural area so when a fire starts there people are going to notice it's not and you can tell because the burned out remnants of the fire is not to the ground and I'm familiar with fires because when I was a child when I was in kindergarten I had a house that I was living in that burned down uh, I remember sleeping and my mom woke up and this is relayed to me later that she heard glass breaking and she said my dad somebody's breaking in he went opened the door and the whole bottom was engulfed in flames he came and got my mom and him came and got me and my sister threw us over their shoulder and carried us down we had those old tv antennas from the third floor i think and we escaped but the house didn't escape it burned it was completely destroyed completely destroyed there was there was no standing structure everything was just down to the ground and was ash so 
I'm, I'm familiar with the scary aspect of fires. Now, ours obviously wasn't arson, uh, but we lost everything nonetheless. Now, we lived in a royal area where we had like one or two neighbors, and they were, you know, I would say the closest one was 100 yards away. So, or maybe a little bit closer than that. But again, this happened at 3 in the morning. Much like this one, though, this fire happened at 4 o'clock, 4 a.m. So, but there's a lot of houses, as you can see. So, the fire department was there rather relatively quickly, and not the whole structure burnt down, and that's what I'm trying to get to. Well, let's go back into this timeline a little bit, now that I've told you a little bit about her victimology, and you can see what you have a glimpse into what type of person she is. You don't have everything, right? So, the timeline. There's certain aspects in this timeline that raise red flags to me, and that's and I'll get into them. The first is July 3rd. She gets into an argument. Now, how do we know this? Because the boyfriend, Alex, is certainly talked to he's interviewed by police anytime i see argument surrounding a disappearance it raises a red flag yet what i find interesting is usually when the person who is in the argument with the victim is interviewed and he relays this information He's usually not guilty. Now, why? Because he, he has no reason to say he was in an argument with her unless it was witnessed by somebody, right? He could completely leave that out. Yet, he tells that to investigators. We got into an argument because I felt she was bathing, uh, I believe it was her son, the six-week-year-old, in dirty kitchen sink water so that bothers me because it's an argument okay but he didn't have to say that he certainly could have said we talked we had a good time went for a walk whatever it was had lunch but he says the argument. Now he could be minimizing. You know, suspects will do that a lot. They will say something like, let's say they are being investigated for uh, uh, an assault, sexual assault of a child. Uh, they'll minimize and they'll say, well, yeah, I, I was at the playground and we were playing and, uh, you know, I, I just was joking around and I gave her a kiss on the cheek when in turn witnesses saw the individual grab her and m make out with her or attempt to make out with her that's minimizing okay could that be here yeah it could be only the police know you know what what those interviews consisted of but that July 3rd bothered me because of him mentioning the argument and that's not the only thing that bothers me and you'll see what I mean by that remember what the argument was about July 4th the boyfriend Alex calls the house calls Joey's gets no answer he calls it a couple times there's no answer no return calls July 5th Alex goes drives back to Joey's house knocks on the door gets no answer this is when a neighbor sees Joey pushing a stroller. He says that he acknowledges her, but she didn't say anything back. I've only seen this referenced once, one or two times, and I'm not sure what to make of it. Uh, but I included it here because he should be possibly an unbiased witness, right? Uh, so I included it. 
July 6. Joey receives a home health care visit for the six week year old. There's no answer. The home health care nurse notices her car is in the driveway and she peeks inside and she sees the baby carrier and diaper bag. Okay, good observations, but no answer. July 7th, Alex goes to the house once again. He observes no car in the driveway. Now that's very important. July 8th, Alex goes back to the house. The car is there. He leaves a note this time. You know, hey, get a hold of somebody. You know, again, remember her victimology. This is not unusual behavior by her. After arguments, she shuts down. Okay. July 9th, July 10th, he calls. He gets no answer. Mom starts calling. No answer. No, she's just not answering. On July 11th, home health care is there again. This time they call Alex. And Alex meets the home health care nurse at the house in Sykesville at Joey's. They notice mail piled up on the steps. The child carrier and the diapers are in the same place. They haven't been moved. This time, Alex leaves a note and says, hey, I don't know what the note says, but basically, we're calling police. <coughs> and I believe in Alex's mind. He still believes she's shut down and she's ignoring them. That's on July 11th. On July 12th, the house goes up in flames. And this is at 4 a.m. At 3 a.m., a neighbor says the car was in the driveway. So there is the details of the timeline. A lot of pieces that don't make sense. One of them being the movement of the vehicle. When police respond to the fire, they determine it's arson. But what they also find, which is very disturbing, is the remains of the six-week-old six child. And they're in the bathtub. Now, remember when I said, what was the argument about? The argument was about bathing. And for the child to be in the bathtub raises a red flag to me. Now an autopsy was conducted on the infant and it was determined the infant was dead before the fire. Now how do they know that? Again, I'm not a pathologist, but I would surmise that there was no there was no carbon dioxide, no smoke in the lungs of the child, which means he had stopped breathing before the fire and placed in the bathtub. Now the argument that Alex and Joey got into about the bathing of that child this raises a red flag to me. Could be completely coincidental. Yet, what are the reasons that you would put a child into the bathtub? Um, you know, right off the bat, one is to bathe the child. Now, if she was getting scolded, or got into an argument about bathing the child in the sink, it would stand to reason that maybe she went to the bathtub to bathe the child. Secondly, 
you were taught that at least a long time ago that you were to put somebody in the child to um, like a tornado come through or a hurricane, but we didn't have any of that, right? It just would lead me to believe, you know, something in that bathtub. Now, if she drowned the child in the bathtub, I would expect that the pathologist would be able to tell that, even though they were not able to tell the, the, the manner of death, if, if, and this is a big if, if you can tell that there's not smoke in the lungs, then wouldn't you be able to tell whether water was in the lungs? But you could also put a child in the bathtub as a quote-unquote tomb. Does that make sense? Like, um, he'll be safe in here even if the house is burning kind of mentality. So now police are in, you know, they're in full mode. Houses burnt, arson is investigated. We have a missing 33 year old woman, but you have her child in the bathtub deceased. All right, so there's the story. Now let's get into the meat and potatoes of the case. And that is what happened. Well, as I told you in the beginning, I don't know, but we can deduce some things. Remember, her car was seen at 3 a.m., one hour before the fire. The fire occurs at 4 a.m., the car is no longer there. So the car was found a few days later in State College, Pennsylvania at the Nittany Apartment Complex. Now, what is significant about that? It's two things. One, the car is backed into a parking stall. Remember, this is a big apartment complex. It houses a lot of college students. But what is more significant is that Joey and Alex used to live at that apartment complex. Now, to me, that, that is huge. Okay, think of this. Of the millions of places her car could have been found, airport, supermarket, Walmart, along the road, hidden, buried, drove into a body of water, a million scenarios. The car happens to end up in a place where she and her ex-boyfriend lived. Remember I told you, I do. I do believe in coincidences when they are. This is not. To me, this is the biggest clue in this whole case. Because it allows you to deduce. Now, what's it allow you to deduce to? Whoever drove that car or was inside that car, doesn't necessarily mean they were driving, knew and was familiar with Joey and that she lived there or they lived there. Somebody in that car. It's not happenstance that that car ended up in her former residence. Now, I would like to know where exactly that car was parked in relation to where their apartment was. Is that a big deal? No, it's not a big deal. It's in the same complex. Uh, that's good enough for me. Now, one of the things that they, when they went through and they found the infant in the fire, another thing that they found was her purse and her ID. They found a gas can. 
they found hamburger meat on the counter. Now remember, this house wasn't totally destroyed. So you had remnants that was easily to look through. The hamburger meat had maggots in it. The tests that were done on the hamburger meat showed that it more than likely was left out on the counter between July 3rd, when that argument took place between her and Alex, and July 5th. Now, it's easy to say, well, she went missing on July 3rd, because who would leave open hamburger out? Yet her car was moving after July 3rd and July 5th. Now, was it her that was driving the car, or was it an offender? That is what we have to determine and I'm not sure that we can but what I can say is something seemed to me to interrupt her and we can deduce that by the hamburger now let's say that Joey decided to run away She's just going to leave the hamburger out on the counter. Why is the hamburger out on the counter? Who is she cooking for? She certainly isn't feeding, hopefully, hamburger to a six-week-year-old, right? No. It's obviously for herself. What's the quantity of hamburger? That's important. If you have something like this, and she's, you know... In the midst of making patties or something, you would think, okay, there's more than one person there. If it's just a hamburger-sized amount, then maybe she's just cooking for her. But much like the John Benet Ramsey case with the pineapple being out, something interrupted it. Now the question is, what interrupted it? Her own thoughts? Why she's making hamburger? Does she say... I can't take this anymore. I'm, I'm, I'm out. And just leaves it there like a robot, walks upstairs, murders her infant, gets in her car. Or is it she's making the hamburger, having an argument with the boyfriend or somebody else? Something happens and it interrupts it. Hamburger, to me, is a big clue. The car being backed in. Through victimology, talking to her family, they would say there's no way she did that. She was a horrible driver, and there's just no way she would do that. I, I don't like that statement and I don't like people that say that um, because during stressful situations there's a lot of times you can do things that you wouldn't normally do. So I don't like when people say, well, they, she would never do that. Yet, I couple that with a report that the car seat, the driver's side was pushed all the way back and it was reclined back. Now that does bother me because that's not, she was five foot one. She wouldn't have done that. So it leads me to believe that yes, somebody else was probably driving that car. I think maybe one of the prevailing theories is that she suffered from postpartum depression and she killed her newborn and then fled. I don't see that here. At least I don't see that being the top theory. And I'll tell you why. 
One is the hamburger being left out. Something interrupted that. Two. She left her ID and her purse and her money and everything there. Now this is a person who has a mentality of a 14 year old. Where is she going to go if she's running away from her life? Now her mom and family will say she would never do that because she would never leave her other kids. Um, again, I don't believe that. Just because I've seen people do things like that and just family just like suicide people say hey, it could never happen they would never do it and, they, and it's proven they have so uh, I remember the case of Michelle Whitaker she would never just run away never 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 because she wouldn't leave her dog in that house she loved that dog she took that dog everywhere she dressed up that dog and she had pictures with that dog she loved that dog more than herself Guess what? Michelle Whitaker's found alive. Michelle Whitaker, decades later, says, yeah, I just I just ran away. I left everything. So, there you go. Now, I'm certainly not comparing a dog to children, but in some cases, people love their dog more than their children. That's no, no doubt. So, it's just, where is she going to go? Now, I think of Michelle Whitaker in her case, where she left everything and she went and started anew. With no money, no clothes. Yet, victimology tells us that she had a speech impediment, she had de developmental disabilities, and she was very naive and trusting. I don't see her smart enough to do this and that's not a knock so it's nothing like that it's just with a, a 14 year old mentality I think she would have taken her purse she would have taken money because listen it's not really a spur of the moment decision it's not a split second decision from the timeline July 3rd to the arson on July 12th you have plenty of time to think about things. Even if you're shutting down, you can plan it. And even if this was the plan, you take your purse, you take your ID, you take money. Now, there's some critics out there and some idiot people that will say, well, she left the purse on purpose because she wanted to throw off investigators. Listen, you, the people that think like that, you... you you get your you think too much into it you have to remember she has a 14 year old mentality she or she would be about self preservation at that age and that is hey I don't have my child anymore I'm going to take care of myself well the one way you have to do that is you have to have ID you have to have money you have to have clothes now, I guess there is no indication that I see that she took no clothes. Maybe she did. But the totality of everything points me away from her doing this alone. Now, another scenario that I must look into, obviously, is the boyfriend. Remember, the argument on July 3rd. He has to be looked into. Now, I've realized recently he was arrested for some um, drug trafficking, some firearm charges. That doesn't automatically make him a suspect. I believe that he was probably a felon, and I think I read this, and had drug issues before this incident. So he just escalated from a drug user to a drug peddler. I mean, that's... That's not uncommon. But doesn't mean he's a murderer. Now, it seems like he's cooperated with police, but I did read he failed a polygraph. Now, does that bother me? No, not necessarily. I don't believe in polygraphs. 
I've seen them work. But I've also seen them not work on more occasions. It's always the post-offense and, and pre-offense behavior and questioning that I am always wanting to know about. And that is, you, you ask him questions about this and, and other things that, before the test. Then you instruct the test, give the test, tell him how he did on the test, and then you go back over those questions and see what the deviations are. That is what I would be more interested in. Now, it seems to me that whoever the offender is had access to her car. The car being there, the car not being there, and then the car being there. Now, one aspect that I didn't talk about that I think is very relevant to this is that Joey had some internet problems. And by that, I don't mean broadband or fiber optic. I mean she would talk to people on the internet, much like a lot of people do. Um, but it was something that her mom noticed and said that somebody wanted her to engage in photographs and pornographic material. Now, I don't know how true that is, but with her victimology being naive and very trusting, I'm concerned about that. Now, one of the reasons I want to, let's say I'm, I want to focus in on Alex, and for good reason. What makes me rule him out a little bit, other than him saying they got into an argument, is how could he start to fire, murder Joey, and get her car to the Nittany Apartments? What's he going to do? Now, now he is an hour and a half from home. How's he getting home? Right? Sets the fire, gets in Joey's car, drives it to a place he's familiar with, a place where maybe in his mind, hey, me and Joey used to live here. You know, it's going to look like she ran back to her past or whatever. Parks the car there. How's he getting home? That's not impossible. I doubt he's walking. Could. But he would have to call somebody. Or take a taxi. Or hitchhike. You would be able to, through alibis, through work, through whatever, narrow him down as a suspect. Based on that. He would have to have somebody pick him up more than likely. If he had a cell phone in 2007, you could certainly get those records and determine if he called anybody. Let's say he's not a suspect because he provided an alibi. His mom. Well, I would want to look into that alibi a little bit further because families always give alibis and they're not always true. If the mom or somebody went and picked him up at those apartments, right? It's something that has to be looked into. But again, I find it hard to believe that this would happen, meaning he would kill his newborn, kill her, remove the body. You know, we didn't even discuss that yet but yet leave the body of the newborn there, drive her car all the way to State College, Pennsylvania, and then hope to find a way home. That doesn't make sense to me. Now, I want to go back to July, July 11th, when she misses the appointment again and Alex and the caseworker are at the house. The male's still on the steps 
the diaper bag and stroller or not stroller the carrier haven't moved he leaves another note there yet this note is specific when he says hey if nobody hears from you I'm calling the police and in fact he did report her missing the next day when the fire occurred now, I'm not sure I believe it was before the fire occurred um, but that note let's talk about that that to me is what is called a triggering event in the offender much like uh, Tiffany Valente she you know has this big fight she's confronted about with her friend her mom her dad about stealing and they caught her red-handed caught her with the card and she's confronted and she's embarrassed you know like this is the second time this has happened I'm disappointing my family I'm disappointing my friends why am I so stupid why do I do this and I see no way out and then you take your own life that was the triggering event for that to me when you look at the arson and it occurs a few hours right after that note is placed there to me that's a triggering event meaning somebody saw that note and saw that police were coming Therefore, I have to make a decision. I have to act now. To me, it would indicate Joey's involvement at this juncture. Or Joey and somebody else's involvement. Now, if it was just her... She reads that note, and maybe she's already killed her infant. And she's just struggling with what to do, right? It doesn't make sense because of the hamburger being out. You're to tell me that that the note is left that says going to call police unless you get a hold of somebody and all of a sudden she's going to where does she get the gas from does she cut her own grass okay does she have a lawnmower there does she have a tractor any i mean police and i'm sure they did this but i hope they did it i've been going to gas stations within you know the block there you know or however what the nearest gas station is they probably didn't have surveillance video but maybe they did but hey did this girl come in and get gas no did any did you see anybody that came and got gas but you're to tell me she went and got gas came back where was that gas poured that's important and arson you can tell that because it's going to be charred more where the gas is poured if it's poured in that bathtub, then there's certainly intent there, for sure. Uh, but, I mean, I just don't see her doing that. But, again, I don't know enough about her victimology to say that. So, I shouldn't say that. What if she had met somebody? It's the only way that I, it makes sense to me is that she met somebody through the internet and he drove the car and she was with him whether it's voluntary or or kidnapping if it was the boyfriend who was involved in this wouldn't Joey's remains be found in that fire right you're setting the fire to destroy evidence right 
if he got into an argument with her on July 3rd and he killed her, killed his kid, which makes no sense, and then he starts the fire, wouldn't her body be found there? It makes no sense that you would remove a you know, 100 pound dead weight body, but yet leave a newborn's. You'd think it would be vice versa. You can easily remove the newborn. That doesn't make sense to me. Which leads me back to being that Joey is involved somehow. But is she involved on her own free will? Or is she involved as in like a kidnapping? It seems to me that somebody, maybe not Joey, was staying... It was in that house and had access to her car if it wasn't her. If somebody else was staying in that house, let's say somebody she met through the internet, there would have to be evidence of that, that probably that fire didn't destroy. You know, if you look through the garbage and you find bush light cans and she didn't drink well okay how did these get here if there's cigarette butts in an ashtray and she didn't smoke if the toilet seat is up things like that I would be very curious to know the car being found there leads me to believe that she's involved either as a passive type of player or that she ran away but I just can't I don't I can't I don't believe she could run away without help that's why I keep going back to an accomplice it is I guess possible she could run away without help it's possible I just don't think that it's probable especially with the car seat being pushed back backed into the stall there's only one reason you do that it's intent you're hiding your license plate think of Delphi and Richard Allen and his car being backed in there that's why you do it you're trying to delay identification just like some people that murder somebody in their bedrooms and when they exit they shut and lock the door you do it to in your mind you're delaying the identification, the finding. And that is what's happening with this car. It's almost as if maybe she was chatting with somebody on the internet. And, and that, maybe they took a bus to get there. Because a stranger can't just show up with a vehicle, right? Because that vehicle would be found at the residence. Let's say a stranger shows up. She's talking to somebody on the internet. He says, "Yeah, I'll come. I'll come meet you." He drives up there for more than likely sexual purposes. They get into an argument, whatever it is. Uh what he kills the six year old six week old infant and then abducts her and where should we drive to and she says uh, the only place i know is the mount nittany apartments or whatever his car would still be there and plus that just does not make sense it doesn't make sense <sighs> let me go through my notes here a little bit I have a question mark about a stroller being found. Was her stroller found? That neighbor who said he saw her pushing the stroller, where was that? I'm just curious to if that was ever found. Person ID found in the house. That bothers me. The gas can in the house. The hamburger with the maggots in it. The car found in Mount Nittany Apartments. She and her ex lived there. The seat was pushed back and reclined. The car was found backed in with intent victimology if a lone male offender was responsible for this 
he would have to have no transportation. And we started to get into that by saying he would have had to have taken a bus. Okay? And maybe that's what happened. He took a bus and Joey went and picked him up at the bus stop. That would account for the movement of the car. It would also account for the car being abandoned at the Mount Nittany apartment. You know, because let's say she's been talking to somebody for a while. And he has no transportation. And she says, well, if you come to my house, I'll pick you up at the bus stop. So he goes to the bus stop, gets her, or she goes and gets him. They drive back. He says, listen, I, I love you, but I, I can't. I can't have a child. We can't raise a child if, if we are leaving and going on the run. And maybe they both murder this, the infant. And then they get in the car and leave. Yeah, that is okay. But again, it, what? She doesn't take her purse. What if the lone offender is there? And he kills her and the kid, steals her car, drives it to the Mount Nittany Apartments, gets on a bus and goes, makes no sense. What would be the motive? You know, a six-week-old child. There is, you know, I investigated a case where a five-year-old was murdered. And I had to come up with why 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 well a five-year-old if they're not sexually assaulted can be a witness they know who that person is a six week old does not know who somebody is they can't identify you what would be the purpose that squarely points the finger at Joey or the boyfriend. They're the only two people that would have reason, motive to murder an infant. Is it possible that it was an accident? And Joey, covering her tracks, decided to leave. Yes, it's very possible, but yet not taking her ID or anything. To me, she would have to be meeting up with somebody. If it, it just for me, it would be a lot more difficult of a decision, I think, if if her body was found in that house. But with her being gone, it just leads me to two scenarios. One is that she had help doing this. She's no criminal mastermind. Or in the unlikely event, she did it herself all alone without help from anybody. Now, that is the prevalent, I believe, working theory. But there's a couple of things that just make me think that that is not possible. So, <laughs> that's the best I can do on this case. Again, the hamburger, the car, where it was found, not how it was found. The triggering event, saying I'm calling the police, almost like somebody was staying there, like freeloading, um, and, and did a nefarious activity, and then said, you know what, I got to go. Police are coming. I can't stay here. But you would think neighbors would notice that. If somebody else was hanging around there, you would think neighbors would notice Man, I would just love to know more about Joey from co-workers, from friends. Could she have pulled this off? Again, to me, the baby being 
killed is her or her ex. I'm not saying intentional. Could have been accident. I just don't see a stranger doing that. Has it happened in the past? Sure. It has. But it's not, it's not common. It's more common for a postpartum mother to do that. That's going by statistics. I mean, it'll tell you that. Now, I know the family doesn't want to believe that, and I understand that. And I'm not saying that's what happened. I'm saying that if I was investigating it, I wouldn't rule out others. But because of that baby being found there and Josie's, Joey's body not, you have to look at Joey. You know? Intriguing case. Really intriguing. Uh, I hope someday she is found. You know? I just, I don't, I don't understand if somebody could, would leave a newborn in there, destroy evidence, but yet remove her body and bury it somewhere else. That just makes no sense. I'm not saying it couldn't happen. You know, certainly could. Um, but, you know, it's possible an offender took her somewhere in a car, willingly, killed her, went back to the house, killed the newborn, but does, does that make sense to you? You know, you always got to ask yourself, does it make sense? Now, a lot of times, murder in general doesn't make sense. Yet, I think if you look at it through a lens of, okay, let's look at possibilities versus probabilities. If you do that, it's more probable that somehow Joey had a hand in this. Somehow, some way. Yet, yeah, that's not 100%. I, I'd like to know more about that hamburger. I know that sounds weird, but just like John Bonet with that pineapple being there and Burke's like not recognizing it, something interrupted the eating of that pineapple. Were these being laid out for hamburger helper? Were they making patties? How many was there? Things like that. It's very important, you know, to determine. Seemed like something interrupted that. Okay. Was there a knock on the door? Was it the boyfriend? Would she ever leave that child alone? Was she attacked when she was doing a stroller and forced back into her home? A lot of questions I don't have answers for, but the, the goal of this is to give somebody that's investigating it, you know, something to think about, you know, something to look at, and hopefully there'll be some answers, you know, and that's the goal. The goal of all cold cases, I used to think, is to solve them, but it's not what you know, it's what you can prove. So instead, I think, well, maybe the goal of cold cases is to move it forward get that next lead that helps you establish something so you know what happens and maybe someone never thought about that hamburger you know or something like that and they're like oh yeah makes sense that's the goal of this channel that's the goal of this video i hope joey offit is found alive and well and she just says hey i made a mistake i'm ready to come clean and this is it. That's my hope. I don't know if it'll happen or not, but that's my hope. So, for another edition of Unsolved No More, I appreciate all you guys hanging with me. Look out for the new TV show coming out soon. And uh, until next time, Mains out.